Uh, so it's just a real tremendous honor to be here with you all. And again, my name is David Sun Kong. I direct the Community Biotechnology Initiative at the Media Lab at MIT. And I'm also the founder of a, an art technology and community center in Central Square in Cambridge called EMW. And as John mentioned, I'm also a synthetic biologist. Uh, I love organizing communities. Um, I love photography, DJ, uh, DJing, uh, beatboxing mediocrely. Um, and and I, again, I really enjoy the intersection between the science and the arts. And we'll talk a lot about that today. And so I wanted to start with a question. And the question is kind of a strange one. And my question is, can hip hop save biotechnology? Um, so first off, how many of you listen to hip hop here in this room? OK, good, good. We, we have, we have hip hop heads in the room. So um, I love hip hop. and. Um, one of the big questions that I, I explore and think a lot about is this intersection between the art and the life sciences. And when we think about biotechnology, you know, we're at a really interesting historical moment. Um, this is a quote from Nicholas Negroponte, the founder of the Media Lab, Biotech is the New Digital. And what Nicholas is referring to is the impact that biotechnology has now, but increasingly will have on society, and that the impacts could be as profound and perhaps even more profound than the digital revolution, which is saying quite a lot. And so, Indeed, we're in this era where we're now able to uh, synthesize entirely new molecules of DNA that have never before existed, reprogram organisms, giving them new properties and functions, um, turning cells into factories that can produce fuels and uh, materials and chemicals. Uh, we can potentially even stall uh, organisms inside the body that can directly sense and respond to disease. And increasingly now, you're starting to see things like cellular agriculture. You're starting to see uh, the production of meats and leather and basically animal products, except having them being grown and fermented in bioreactors, which is a really amazing thing. Um, how about a spider silk tie that is made from spider silk proteins that, again, were, were created inside a, a laboratory inside a bioreactor? And so uh, one of the more profound implications, I think, of biotech is from uh, my colleague Kevin Esvelt at the Media Lab, who's working on a technology called Gene Drives, where you can use uh, something called CRISPR-Cas9, which is a precise genome editing technology, to drive a genetically engineered trait through a wild population of, uh, of organisms. So potentially doing things like ending malaria within a, a certain wild population of mosquitoes, which is really profound, but also the implications are pretty staggering, right? Where can this all unfold, and, and what does it mean for humanity? One possible future? Uh, you know, I don't know if you have many people watch Westworld here, TV. So Westworld is one of my favorite TV shows, but it's a really scary show, right? It's a show where kind of the, the top ultra elites of the world have control of all of this advanced biofabrication and synthetic biology and, and artificial intelligence, and, uh, and we're kind of the rest of the, the, the people are, are sort of left with nothing. And there's an alternate version, an alternate future of biotechnology that maybe looks a little bit more like this. And so this is a photograph that I took, again, at my community center at EMW. And at EMW, uh, we do work with marginalized communities. We serve communities that are socially, uh, socioeconomically diverse, culturally diverse, creatively diverse. And to me, you know, this is, I think, the, the, the dream for the future faces of, of the biotechnology and the life sciences, something that's incredibly uh, inclusive and diverse. And so the question is, when we're talking about something like biotech that has such a tremendous impact on not only humankind, but the entire living world, how do we ensure that there's very broad, diverse participation? Because right now, if you think about it, the life sciences and biotech, it's a pretty privileged thing, right? Where do you go if you want to get into the life sciences? Um, you know, for right now, the spaces that practice the life sciences include corporations. Again, we're here in Boston and in, uh, in, in, in Cambridge and Boston. We're, we're really in the biotech capital of the world. Um, you've got places like the Media Lab, where I have the great privilege of working. Um, but again, this, this is a really very privileged art form. And so part of what's happened in the past eight or nine years um, has been the emergence of biotech spaces and uh, basically community laboratories in some pretty unusual types of spaces. So this is a, a, a photograph or a, a caption from uh, from Nature in 2010 from Rob Carlson, who's a, a colleague, uh, you know, says that the era of garage biology is upon us. Um, and basically, he's indicating and pointing us towards a new era where folks are able to do things in places like garages. And I don't know if you know who these guys are. These are a couple of Steves, a couple of famous Steves, and, uh, and they did some pretty cool stuff in a garage that uh, has impacted uh, society in a really significant way. And a lot of people look at biotech and some of these emerging spaces and are thinking a similar thing. This is my boss at the Media Lab, Joey Ito, and a number of years ago when Joey was starting getting excited about synthetic biology and biotech, we had to find a laboratory space for him to go and do some work, and we couldn't find one, right? You either would have to go into a, a lab of, a, of an existing, of a existing principal investigator and kind of ask if we could do, uh, bring a novice into the lab and do some, some work in your sophisticated lab, and we ultimately had to go and do this work in Joey's kitchen, okay? So, so, uh, so again, apologies for Joey and, and the, the photograph of his kitchen, but, um, but you know, 
know, this was, this was a sign of the times. But fortunately now, there's an emergence, again, of these wonderful community laboratories. So this is Genspace uh, in Brooklyn, which was founded around 2009, 2010. Uh, BioCurious out in the West Coast in Sunnyvale. And again, for my hip hop analogy, you know, BioCurious and Genspace are like the Tupac and Biggie of, of uh, community bio labs. It's like the East Coast, West Coast, uh, uh, you know, challenge that happened there. And so we're starting to see these labs emerge in really interesting places. La Jolla has got a, uh, a biotech lab emerging in their public library. Um, there's the BioBus, one of my favorites, right? You can drive around and teach these people about the life sciences. Uh, one of my former students, um, Benno from Peru, is doing an incredible project where they're building a biofab lab, a lab that can actually float on the Amazon River and visit different indigenous communities and study the, uh, uh, the biodiversity of the Amazon. Um, and so we're starting to see these really remarkable spaces. And so when I joined the Media Lab uh, last year, one of the first things that we did and uh, my group did was to organize the first ever global community bio summit where we brought together uh, more than 200 folks from all around the world that were building out these wonderful independent community laboratories uh, from really every corner of the world. And we had a really remarkable and transformational event uh, two years ago and last year, we did a follow-up event, or I'm sorry, just a few weeks ago, we did a follow-up event uh, that just wrapped up, and we had more than 400 people apply from all around the world, 350 people came, and uh, again, really building this global movement around, um, around distributed uh, biotechnology and the life sciences. And we had a really wonderful statement of purpose that we, we came up with. And so the statement of purpose reads, um, our shared purpose is to fundamentally transform the life sciences and democratize biotechnology, to inspire creativity and improve lives by organizing life science change makers and bio enthusiasts, to build an inclusive global network, cultivate an accessible commons of knowledge and resources, launch community labs and projects, and enable local educators. What do you guys think about that as a statement of purpose? It's pretty great. Um, and so, so this is a really remarkable global movement that's happening. And um, there's other really amazing uh, institutions that are built around uh, bringing life sciences to the people as well. So this is the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, or iGEM. How many of you have heard of iGEM before? A few of you. So it's basically a giant science fair for synthetic biology nerds. So undergrads and high school students and, and grad students from all around the world come to Boston, come to the Heinz Convention Center to share their projects uh, at the end of uh, October or so. I've been working with iGEM since around the early 2000s. Probably my most important role with iGEM, though, is I'm the official iGEM DJ. So um, <laughs> since about 2014, I get to rock kind of, it's, it's the party that I DJ every year where I, I genuinely fear for my life um, because these synthetic biology nerds are just so excited and they're so ready to dance um, after working so hard on their projects all summer. So that's kind of what I do. If you have a, um, I, I, I basically, I DJ for science nerds. So if you have a science nerd party, please come hire me for your function. Um, and so I go back to an original question I asked, can hip hop save biotechnology, right? And, and I ask this again because hip hop is a cultural movement, it's a cultural force, right? And so here's a, a photograph. Does do anybody know who this is? Can you raise your hand if you know who this is? Okay, so this is, this is a, 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 an artist, an artist named Childish Gambino, who's a rapper but also does a lot of work um, in the arts and is really one of our major cultural forces, I think, in the US and beyond. And why is culture important? This is a quote from uh, Franklin Foer. He says, innovations don't magically appear or simply proceed on the basis of some scientific knowledge. The culture prods them into existence, right? I think it's a really profound quote and one, something that's important to reflect on. So the culture and the arts and the life sciences, these are all kind of together in a really powerful uh, mixture. And so uh, one of the questions we asked was, how do we combine and think about something like hip hop and bring that together with the life sciences and biotech? And so one of the areas that I love uh, in scientific research right now is the human microbiome, right? So here we're talking about the hundreds of trillions of microorganisms that live in harmony with the human body and very influ influential in development and cognition, um, disease states and beyond. But we asked ourselves kind of a different question, which was, what does our microbiota sound like, right? Like, what if we could somehow make an instrument and somehow take data about the organisms from the body and turn that into music? Because music crosses all boundaries, right? Don't, I don't care about your politics, what your socioeconomic status is. Every human being has a connection with music. And so we built a system called Biota Beats, okay? It's a microbial record player that translates data from the microorganisms from the body into sound and music. And so again, I'm a DJ, right? So I love scratching vinyl records, but what if you could scratch a biota record, right? Um, note the, uh, the vinyl gloves and the appropriate sterile technique. Um, and so, so we created this, this system, and, and it's built actually on top of a retrofit turntable, so you can take your biota record, sample organisms from the body, put them on the biota record, it sits in, onto the turntable, which is actually an incubator, 
we image the microbes over time, we collect data about those organisms, and then we have algorithms that convert that data into uh, MIDI files that uh, then uh, producers that we work with then produce, uh, generate the final musical comp composition. So it's a really neat system. These are some of the pictures of our, of our biota records. These are laser cut and have bacteria food on them so that the microbes will grow. Um, this is one of our students, Annie, who's uh, sampling some of her toe microbes and uh, putting that onto the biota record. And again, um, you know, as I, I mentioned, this is how we kind of collect the data and we image them over time. And so uh, I'm curious, do you all want to hear some microbial music? Yeah, OK. Awesome, awesome. So why don't we start with um, a little bit of microbial music here. And, um, start with some feed bacteria. I'll just, nothing needs to be said here. Um, this is uh, the belly button, very ethereal sounding. If you don't shower, this is how your armpit sounds. is the oral microbiome, and when you put it all together, it sounds like this. think? Pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, so we had a really amazing team that worked on this, and uh, we thought to ourselves, okay, you know, people have vinyl record collections, right? What if you could have a biota record collection? Like, what if you could actually sample microorganisms from like an artist that you thought was really awesome, and then make beats out of their bacteria, right? <laughs> Right? So, so again, I'm a photographer. This is, this is a photograph that I took of Q-Tip, who's one of my favorite all-time MCs and, and DJs. And this is another photograph I took of, uh, of Questlove. And, um, and I had the good fortune last year speaking at the same event as this guy. Anybody know who this is? You might recognize him more in this picture. So, so this is the legendary DJ Jazzy Jeff, uh, who worked with the Fresh Prince and is one of the great legends in hip hop and DJing. And so I was at the same event as Jeff, and uh, I basically I set up a little uh, DIY uh, lab in, in the green room, and I said, Jeff, you know, you're, you know, it's such an honor to meet you. We're, we're, we have this project called Biota Beats where we're making music out of, uh, out of bacteria from the body, and you know, can we sample some of your microbes? And, um, and you know, DJ Jazzy Jeff, he's like, looks at me, he's like, man, you know, this is, this is one of the strangest questions anybody's ever asked me. <laughs> he's, but he's like, yeah, let's do it, I'm down. So DJ Jazzy Jeff, you know, one of the great hip hop, you know, icons of all time, you know, goes and basically, you know, he's sampling his oral microbiome. And, and this, I think, is one of my favorite pictures I've ever taken of all time. Like, look at how happy DJ Jazzy Jeff is. <laughs> look, at how, look at how, look how much full of joy he is right now, inoculating this LB biota record with some of his oral microbiota. So, so Jeff just had a really amazing experience, and, you know, we've been working with their team. And one of the most satisfying things that came out of this, uh, you know, Jeff was going on tour with Will Smith for the first time in a very long time. And his manager was like, you know, David, we've been learning from you about the microbiome and how the microbiome is dynamic and changes in response to stress and diet and everything else. What if we, what if we did a bio to beat of Jeff, like before he went on tour, after he went on tour, and during tour, and saw how it changed? And I was just like kind of crying on the other end of the phone, because I'm like, you know, it's like, it's like these, this, this, this hip hop legend and their team, like they get it. Like they understand this like really core idea from the life sciences. So I think music is a really beautiful way, again, to communicate science. And I'll just close with a really quick, quick story about iGEM. So the, the thing that we did to build from, from DJ Jazzy Jeff's uh, bio to beat, and we've done a bunch of other bio to beats since then, we created a special song 
at iGEM, the 3,000 person event I mentioned uh, before, called Universe. Universe means one song, you know? We're in a mo historical moment right now where I feel like more than ever we need to come together as a big global family, and iGEM really is that. And so we thought, what if we could sample the microorganisms of like 1,000 students and figure out there's a big global competition and create a, a song, a composition with these students? And so that's basically what we did. We, we sampled the students, we had each continent represent a different body part, and then each continent also represent a different musical instrument. So we ultimately created, uh, sampled around 130 of these teams, and, uh, and put together a really, really beautiful global composition. I'll just play you just the start of it, um, just in closing. So this is called Universe. This is the percussion from uh, South America. This is Universe, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that one. So thank you all again so much for your time. I leave you with this meme. Uh, my name is David Sun Kong. Thank you so much again.